live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, I'm Wawodo. Hello and welcome. Tonight, former Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Theophilus Danjuma, urges the service chiefs to take immediate action to end the growing spate of banditry and bandit attacks across the country. As the Chief of Defense Staff, General Christopher Musa, says that the military is committed to safeguarding the nation. The troops of Operation Safe Haven apprehend members of a syndicate that specializes in sales of firearms and ammunition in Plateau State. The Vice President Kashim Shatima assures stakeholders in the aviation sector of the commitment of the federal government to create a conducive and better environment for airline operations in Nigeria. On business news tonight, three tiers of government share 1.2 trillion naira from revenue for August as FAC allocation drops by 11.9% against the previous month. On sports, Manchester City midfielder Rodri says players are close to striking due to increasing fixture demands placed on them. And from the nation's capital, residents of Pape area of the federal capital territory are concerned over a series of earth tremors affecting the area. And in international news from London, Dominique Pellico, the man accused of drugging his wife to sleep and recruiting dozens of men to abuse her for over 10 years, has admitted to all of the charges against him. We begin tonight with security matters as former Chief of Army Staff General Theophilus Danjuma, retired, has asked military top brass, led by the Chief of Defence Staff General Christopher Musa, to end banditry and killings as soon as possible. The octogenarian was speaking in Abuja during the presentation of a book titled Big Boots, Lessons from My Military Service, authored by Major General Solomon Odonwa, retired. In response, the defense chief says the armed forces will not be deterred by the challenges confronting them in the fight against banditry and terrorism. Guests including former and seven service chiefs led by the chief of defense staff and other top military brass and intellectuals gather for the public presentation and launch of a book titled Big Boots, Lessons from My Military Service by retired Major General Solomon Udunwa. The book is an account of over three decades of the retired general's service in the Nigerian army. The book is then unveiled. The former chief of army staff, General Theophilo Stanjima, is the chairman of the event, and he used the opportunity to give a charge to the service chiefs. Our number one problem today is security. We must end the banditry and the killings that are going on in our country as soon as possible. The responsibility are on your shoulders. Those of you who are still serving, no excuses. Absolutely no excuses. In his goodwill message, the Chief of Defense Staff reaffirms the military's commitment to safeguard the nation. The armed forces of Nigeria is positioned, is willing, is dedicated and committed in ensuring that we restore peace and security in our own dear country. We will not relent, we shall not be deterred. There are going to be challenges, yes, but that's why we're here. I want to show I assure you that we have learned a lot from your record. Very, very distinguished senior officers that have modeled us all through the years. We cannot afford to fail and we will not fail. The book launch and the remix highlights the urgent need for decisive leadership to address the escalating banditry crisis in the country.
Trips of Operation Sanity of the Nigerian Army have neutralized four bandits during a clearance operation in Berningwari, local government area of Kaduna State. A statement issued by the Kaduna State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Sama Laruan, says the troops encountered the bandits in Alawa and Kagwa Luk general areas in Berningwari and immediately engaged the bandits in a fierce gun battle, during which two of the criminals were neutralized. The trips also recovered two AK-47 rifles, three magazines, three motorcycles, and one radio from the bandits. The trips also rescued 13 hostages from the kidnappers' hideout in Kachia, local government area of the state. And this is coming after at least three people were reportedly killed, and many others kidnapped by bandits who attacked two churches, in Bakimpa Maro community in Kajuru, local government area of Kaduna State. And still talking security, the governor of Kaduna State, Ubasani, says he is very happy with the efforts made by the military and other security agencies to curb all forms of banditry in the northwest zone. Senator Sani adds that the consistency in the attack of bandit leaders will go a long way in securing the region. He spoke on our political programs, Politics Today. The people of uh, that northwest, as it's not only Zampada, Okoto, Kasina, even Kaduna, and Niger, we are all uh, really happy with uh, the effort made by the military because uh, killing of uh, Abibu Sububu is very, very important because you see someone who uh, commands a lot of other uh, bandits around the Northwest as is so eliminating him will go a long way in addressing most of this problem because most of his followers will be in this area. Most of them certainly uh, will know that uh, it's a matter of time before they are also going to be uh, eliminated. So that is for me, it's a very, very welcome development. Uh, of course, uh, Belletruji for me, just like the CDS have said, uh, General uh, Christopher Musa is another person that uh, I have no doubt in my mind. It's a matter of time before they can also get to him. So for me, uh, it's a welcome development, and I have no doubt in my mind uh, this is just the beginning of uh, most of the successes we're expecting from the uh, military as well as other relevant security agencies uh, in Nigeria. And uh, we, at our level, we will continue to give them all the necessary support because we know they are making all the sacrifice to protect the lives and properties of our own people which is key aspect of governance, as you are aware. Meanwhile, troops of Operation Safe Haven recorded a major breakthrough with the arrest of members of a syndicate specialized in sales of firearms and ammunition in Plateau State. Five members of the syndicate were arrested during an intelligence-driven operation carried out in a hideout located in Karaguta mining area along the Bolchi Road in Joss North Central government area of the state. Firearms and ammunition ranging from locally fabricated rifles, automatic rifles and AK-47 magazines and ammunition as some of the exhibits recovered from the syndicate. The spokesperson of the operation, Major Steven Zakom, paraded the suspects at the headquarters of the operation in Jos, the state capital. <laughs> <laughs> Vice President Kashim Shatima has assured stakeholders in the aviation sector of the commitment of the federal government to create a conducive and better environment for airline operators in the country. He gave the assurance during a meeting with the airline operators in Nigeria at the presidential villa in Abuja, and that's part of efforts to address foreign exchange issues and backlog of payments. The meeting, which also had in attendance representatives from the Central Bank of Nigeria and the National Hajj Commission, comes days after the signing of the Cape Town Convention Practice Directions, which seeks to enable airlines dry lease aircraft. Speaking to State House correspondents shortly after that meeting, the Chief Executive Officer of Airpeace, Mr. Alan Onyema, and Mr. Jumoke Oduwale, who is the Quebec Council Chairman, described the interaction as fruitful. We had some challenges which we discussed, and uh, 
we are satisfied. The government is going to attend to that. They want the airlines and other businesses in Nigeria to succeed. That is why the government has taken it so very seriously about you know uh, uh, having these conversions of um, people from different sectors to discuss further about how to move the nation forward. That is very welcome. We like it. The vice president is worried um, that Nigerian airlines have not been given you know, easy access into some choice airports. And the vice president has also vowed to, you know, meet with his colleagues out there. You know, diplomacy to, there's no quarrel. They are, we're not going to fight. The vice president has taken it up upon himself to make sure that Nigerian airlines are given their dues abroad. His Excellency just chaired a meeting and has set up a small committee, so we're going now to continue the discussions. It was a productive one. All the agencies that were involved in some of the issues that were raised by airline operators last week were present, and some was also delegated to the Honorable Minister of Finance. The Honorable Minister of Aviation is also keeping close tabs on this, but because His Excellency has put such an importance on this, on supporting Nigerian businesses in aviation and other sectors, there was another company in another sector in attendance. We're going to have the follow-up meeting immediately and get back to him. He's giving us by Monday to have some concrete outcomes. So that's what we're going to do. The government of Enugu State has signed a memorandum of understanding with Jelfa Nigeria Limited for the revitalization of Sunrise Flour Mill located in MNA in Enugu State. Performing the function at the government house in Enugu, Governor Peter Mba reaffirmed his administration's commitment in moving the state from a public sector-driven economy through results-oriented partnerships and also making the state an investment-friendly destination. Governor Mba also says the investment size in the project is about 40 billion naira, with Jalfa Group injecting 24 billion naira into the project. Enugu State securing another investment size of uh, 40 billion. Again, this investment will see Jeffa Group injecting 24 billion into the existing Enugu Sunrise Flour Mill. 22 billion will be directly into the revamping and the resuscitation of the Sunrise Flour Mill. And 2 billion is going to come to the state by way of cash, right? And in addition to that, we also have a plan. The SPV is going to own 10,000 hectares of farmland where we're going to cultivate the input for the flower mill. We're going to deal with you every step of the way. We understand what it means for businesses to invest in us. We know also that Businesses are here for the funds and investment. So it's our job to make sure that you achieve that aspiration. In part two, after the break, the People's Democratic Party, the PD, announces an internal arrangement to address issues in River State as the National Working Committee adopts the position of the PDP Governors Forum, recognizing Governor Fubara as a party's leader in the state. Please join us again. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, coming to you live from Channels Television from Lagos. A reminder of our main stories. Former Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Theophilos Danjima, urges the service chiefs to take immediate action to end the growing spate of bandit attacks across the country. As the Chief of Defense Staff, General Christopher Musa, says that the military is committed to safeguarding the nation. Troops of Operation Safe Haven apprehend members of a syndicate that specializes in sales of firearms and ammunition in Plateau State. Vice President Kashim Shatima assures stakeholders in the aviation sector of the commitment of the federal government to create a conducive and better environment for airline operations in Nigeria. And Dominic Pellicott, the man accused of dragging his wife to sleep and recruiting dozens of men to abuse her for over 10 years, has admitted to all the charges against him.
which are now attention to politics. The People's Democratic Party, the PDP, has announced an internal arrangement to address issues in River State. As a National Working Committee adopts a position of the PDP Governors Forum, recognizing Governor Siminalai Fubara as the party's leader in the state who will oversee the party's structure. To resolve ongoing legal issues and divisions within the party, the PDP has now decided to use consensus as its primary method with close collaboration between the Governors Forum and the National Working Committee of the party. The party has also resolved to zone the national chairmanship position to the North Central Region. Governor Bala Mohamed may be known shortly after a meeting with the National the Working Committee the in Bauchi State. We are not here to malign or to denigrate any party. From the point of view of leadership, we must foster uh, collaboration, consensus, and definitely it is not beyond our reach. You all know the relationship between the FCT minister and the current governor. They are that of a mentor and a mentee. And of course, we are working behind the scene to ensure that they come together, they work together in the manner that PDP is not for. But certainly it is not something that we can dictate here at this table, but we have summon the courage and the will to ensure that the correct thing is done. Summary of our discussion on what is on the table in the country about the change of leadership to get uh, from, uh, uh, a permanent leadership in the party because right now, our brother from the North East is acting as chairman and it is a constitutional aberration because according to our constitution, any vacancy that exists must be filled from where that vacancy is created. And we know the North Central has been craving for it and we discuss the issue. We will work with the acting national chairman and the working committee and the party to ensure that the North East is given and the North Central is given the opportunity to assume that responsibility, since we in the North is also uh, benefited from such constitutional arrangement, where after the uh, designation of al Hajibamun the Tuku, our brother, our former governor, Mohammed Abdul Mohadi, became the chairman of the PDP. It is not something that is in contention by the rest of the we have more for you on the news at 10 as we head over to Abuja Studios now where Victoria Longjohn is standing by to give us more. Hello, Victoria. Hello, Anne. Now, residents of Pape area of the Federal Capital Territory are concerned over a series of air tremors affecting the area. Pape, which is in Bwari Area Council, is situated less than 10 minutes from the Abuja Highbrow district of Maitama. Residents of the area told Channels Television that the tremor started at the weekend and continued in the new week. Mama, Pape, a so densely populated area within Bwari now. Area Council, is experiencing earth movement once again. The tremor, which began last weekend and continued intermittently through Monday night, is raising concern amongst residents of the area. This one around, just a small, this is not be like before. And that time we happen towards that, they call the government's attention and the government enter here to do the necessary thing what they're supposed to do. And watch that time the thing stop. Still now, the thing happened again, and the same thing. No need crack, crack for any building. Nothing happened. Just shaking the ground. Let them take action for it. Because from there, we can know what is going on. Though the community bothers one of Abuja's highbrow areas, Maitama, the area is popular for licensed quarry activities, especially in the interior parts of the community. However, residents believe there is no link between the quarry activities and the earth movement. From one o'clock to two, I'm very, very scared because I was inside, but I have to come out, outside to look what is happening. But I see all the mountain, there's nothing like shaking. And then, Maybe in the one hour or one hour, 30 minutes, you still shake again. Every, even here, where you did, shake everywhere. So it is very serious something. May government 
federal government do into do something about it? Even people they hear it, they are think other na blasting. Because you know all this area na blasting places. So even person hear it in go think other na blasting. Before me myself, I think so other na blasting people. This is not the first time that there will be same earth movement in the area. However, the latest tremor did not record any disruptions in the community, though the people want the authorities to address the issue. To politics now, and the Edo Labour Party governorship candidate, Mr. Olumide Akpata, has visited some riverine communities in Ovia Northeast and Ovia Southwest local government areas of the state, which are predominantly populated by the Ijo speaking people of the state. Now, some of the communities visited include Gili Gili in Kuraga, Ofonoma, and Achakurama. At each stop, the LP candidate promised to put an end to what he described as a criminal neglect of the people of these areas by both the PDP and the APC, who have governed the state in the last 25 years. Specifically, he promised to reconnect the communities to mainland Edo State by ensuring that the roads from Ofunama to Udo and from Giligili to Ekenwa in Benin City are immediately rehabilitated. He also promised to run an all-inclusive government that will feature members of these communities at the cabinet level. And the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Tajuddin Abbas, is urging the media to expose state officials who campaign or work against women, political and economic inclusion. Mr. Abbas said this during the United Nations Roundtable with media executives on gender equality and inclusion in Abuja. The Speaker was represented by the Chairperson of the House Committee on Women in Parliament, Mrs. Fatima Talba. Our correspondent, Gloria Mozoke, reports. Providing a platform to amplify the voices of women, accelerate gender equity and the pivotal role they play in economic empowerment is among the core objectives of this event, organized by the UN Women for Media Executives. During the roundtable, the idea to position the media to engender women leadership is further espoused. Nigeria is a country where you, I call a reservoir of educated, qualified, competent, resource-oriented women with expertise are found in this country. What can media do differently to improve the chances of more women joining politics and winning in the next elections? While we've had some success, stark barriers remain. And we found that the most stubborn of these barriers is the perceptions in the public. These challenges are often rooted in long-standing gender stereotypes that portray women as unqualified for leadership and that they often face violence solely for trying to do so. This is what drives our conversation today. To all our media friends present here today, I therefore say, give us women in the headlines, give us female police officers, give us female governors, give us female presidents, give us the Huxtable effect. Thank you. Underscoring media partnership as an essential tool to overcoming the barriers to women inclusion and gender parity, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, who is represented, gives a charge to the media. The media has a crucial role to play in not only highlighting the barriers to women inclusion, but also in advancing these efforts and in holding us accountable and providing insights into where progress is being made. As the national gender policy is illuminated, other participants and media executives lend their voices to the critical issues. In our hands lies the potential to either uphold the status quo or challenge it, to either perpetuate uh, stereotypes or dismantle them. The renewed call for greater women participation in politics and gender equality is apparently built on the strength of years of advocacy and commitment to the cause to change the normative for manifest growth and development across the country. From Abuja, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. And that's it from Abuja. It's now back to you, Anne, for the rest of the news at 10. Thank you, Victoria. Henceforth, any divisional police officer or tactical commander not ready to abide by the core dictate of policing will have it tough with the new police authority in Lagos. And that's coming from the new Lagos Commissioner of Police, Mr. Olarinwaju Ishola, 
Speaking with journalists today, shortly after taking over from the former Commissioner of Police, Mr. Adegoke Fayoade, at the police headquarters in Keja, Mr. Ishola says that he will be fair and firm to all abiding citizens while the security templates in the state will be improved upon. My experiences in Lagos has given me a plethora of people to call in case anything happens anywhere. So community policing will be strengthened, enlarged, and made to be people serving. Uh, concerning the incidences of a crash could be coming to Onroli, those DPOs were not my DPOs. I'm just taking them over. If they just trusted me to be in charge here, all DPOs must discharge their duty. And police work is so encompassing and very, very organized from within. We are what we call offenses against discipline. If you hate genuinely in the discharge of your duty, overlook it. But when you are becoming so recalcitrant to the angle that you think you are untouchable, everybody is touchable. Like I told you, expect a new face of policing in Lagos. Still ahead on the news at 10, three tiers of government share 1.2 trillion Naira from the revenue for the month of August as the federal allocation drops by 11.9% against the previous month. And that's in business news. Please join us again. Welcome back. The Borno State Government is planning to close all emergency camps for internally displaced persons in the next two weeks when the water from the floods expected to recede in areas affected. Governor Babagana Zulum made the statement while addressing officials of the National Emergency Management Agency at the Government House in Maduguri, the Borno State Capital. Governor Zulum says the government will maintain the 36 camps created to cater to those affected within the Maduguri metropolis as efforts are still ongoing to address the structure caused by the flood. The management of the National Emergency Management Agency, led by the Director General, visits the Borno State Governor to commiserate with the state over the flood that has caused destruction to infrastructure, institutions and properties of residents. In her address, the Director General discloses several interventions that have been initiated to ameliorate the hardship that trailed the flood. We have been able to provide in terms of water, ambulances, tents and every other thing that was within our capabilities to provide. We're still part of the search and rescue team. So like I said, we're more or less here to continue to monitor what is ongoing and how where else we need to Yes. Governor Babagana Zulum re-emphasizes that his administration is determined to close all IDP camps before 2027 and the emergency camps created due to the flood will not be left out. Well, we are telling the system that we don't want to, you know, encourage people to stay in the camps. I'm to say that's not a lot the process of sustaining camps for more than 10 years. Finally, we wanted to, to close all the camps in Medical, apart from Mona, Garage, and Red Metal Camp, which we have also agreed to open to close them immediately at the end of the fall. So the water bodies have started the same. We are taking the decision that we should not open another camps apart from the 36 camps that are so far been identified. The NEMA management goes to inspect the relief materials donated to the state as the chairman of the Senate Committee on Special Duties makes a case for increased funding for NEMA. I'm happy that the store is not empty despite being underfunded. It is high time that the federal government of Nigeria rise to the occasion following the calamity that has befallen not only Medugui, but many parts of the country who have experienced perennial flooding in almost all the states of the federation. 
flood has receded in most parts of the affected areas and rescue agencies are wrapping up efforts to provide relief for the victims in collaboration with the Borano state government. The Minister of State for Education, Mr. Tanka Sununu, is advocating the need for entrepreneurial studies in secondary schools to help address the unemployment rate in Nigeria. The minister made the call at the meeting with principals of Unity Colleges in Abuja, where he called on school administrators to address issues of social vices and structural decay in most of their schools. The Minister of State for Education, along with some directors at the ministry, are attending the 2024 annual general meeting of the principals of federal unity colleges. The meeting provides an opportunity for these administrators to set a new academic agenda. And this year, the focus is on entrepreneurship education. We have another opportunity to build ourselves. This gathering, I would say, is our agenda setting meeting. Let us set about skilling our products so we will not only churn out quantitative but highly qualitative products. Entrepreneurship education can help create a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship, leading to job creation, economic growth, and improved living standards. Lending his voice to the call for entrepreneurship education, the Minister of State for Education urges the gathering to upscale entrepreneurship skills in their teaching curriculum. By integrating entrepreneurship education in our curriculum, we can empower our students to become job creators rather than job seekers. We can inspire in them to develop sustainable business models that address societal, drive economic growth, and contribute to national uh, development. We must work together to ensure that we prepare students for the talents of the 21st century by focusing on innovation, critical thinking, and skill development. The minister also calls the attention of the principals to address the moral and infrastructural decay in Unity schools. I will not end my speech without calling the attention of the principal under this August and rare opportunity. Please call on you to pay much attention to the issue of social biases in our schools. This must be addressed. We must also pay much attention to maintain as culture. The high point of the event is the presentation of prizes to some of the federal unity colleges for excellent academic performances in the last senior school certificate examination. From education to business, we're Dominic Iwiwi standing by to take us through the world of business. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. On business news, the sum of 1.203 trillion naira has been shared to the federal government, states and local government councils as revenue for the month of August by the Federation Accounts Allocation Committee. According to a document from the Office of the Accountant General of the Federation, the amount represents 11.9% decline against the 1.358 trillion naira total revenue shared in July. A brief breakdown of the distribution shows that the federal government received the lower sum of 374.92 billion naira. The state governments got 422.86 billion naira and local government councils received 306.53 billion naira. While the sum of 99.47 billion was shared to the benefiting states as 13% of mineral revenue derivation from the total amount. At the same time, a lower sum of 1.221 billion naira was received as cross statutory revenue, while the balance in the excess crude account remains unchanged at $473,754. The Central Bank of Nigeria says it will sustain its ways and means advances to the federal government at a 5% limit for the 2024-2025 fiscal year in its monetary credits, foreign trade, and exchange policy guidelines for the period 
released on its website. The CBN says such advances shall be liquidated as soon as possible and shall in any event be repayable at the end of the year in which it was granted. The financial market regulator explains that the loan facility through which it finances the federal government's budget shortfalls would be determined by recognizing the sub-accounts of various ministries, departments and agencies linked to the Consolidated Revenue Fund. Meanwhile, the CBN has warned that the country's foreign exchange reserves, which currently stands at $36.08 billion, are at risk due to the removal of forced subsidy and lower crude oil earnings. In a statement released today, the Apex Bank also mentioned that increased external debt servicing obligations could pose downside risks for the growth of external reserves during the period. However, the CBN says the outlook for Nigeria's external sector this year and 2025 is optimistic on the expectation of favorable terms of trade, sustained rally in crude oil prices, improvements in domestic crude oil production, as well as gains from capital flows and remittances. The domestic equities market resumed from the Muslim Eid El Malud holiday with a carryover of last week's bullish performance, driven by investors' interest in some high-value stocks. Lady Williams tells us more. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. Let's get a check on how your money performed today. Well, after the August inflation report showing a slowdown in inflation, investors are kicking off this holiday-shortened trading week in bullish uh, sentiment. Their all-share index 0.23% up, 97 point. Uh, 97,685 uh, points. That's for the all share index, 56 trillion market cap. Let's look at the sector of performance. Last week, it was all green for the sectors that we track, but we're seeing oil and gas kicking off on the back foot, um, snapping that 2% gain from last week. Consumer goods, 0.94%, and banking continuing from that 5% um, close for, the, for last week, starting off 1.45% up. Let's get a check on the tier one banks now. They are the drivers today. FBNH adding 10% could be related to the news that um, a federal high court in Lagos refused to declare the 12th annual general meeting of FBN Holdings PLC illegal uh, or not. So I guess uh, investors might be bullish on that, and that's why they're picking up um, those stocks. And we see UBA 2.32%, the laggards, access core, and uh, Zenit Bank today. So... Uh, we might be following the trend from the last two, uh, two trading weeks, both positive. Let's see if we can get three straight weeks of positive closes. But today, the bulls dominate. Thank you, Dominic. We head over to Katsina State now, where the governor, Diko Rada, has restated his administration's commitment to preserving the rich cultural heritage of Katsina State. The governor stated this when he attended the famous annual Durba in Dora in Katsina State. A total of 16 district heads of the Emirate took turns to display cultures and traditions of the Emirates. The event showcased a colorful display of Dora's rich cultural heritage with traditional title holders from the Emirate parading on horseback, accompanied by traumas. Over 100 years, we used to see people from all walk of life, from the south, from the north, from the, from the east, everywhere, uh, to witness this celebration. And uh, there are a lot of other chiefs and emirs and overs from other parts of the country who witness all their representation. I think it has been a very, very solid tradition which the state government has been supporting for many years. My hope is to see more improvement on these celebrations and to see more improvement on maintaining our culture and tradition because we don't have anything more than the culture and the tradition that is left for us. It will explain how our people were before now, even before the coming of the white men. We are here, they, even when the European came to Nigeria, they met us with our culture, with our tradition, with our way of dressing and administration. So I think it is, it is really very profitable. 
Outside our shores, at least nine people have died and thousands more injured after handheld pages used by Hezbollah exploded in Lebanon this afternoon. Hezbollah has blamed Israel for this act, saying that the country will get its fair punishment. Here's Simon Puse with other international news and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the channel's studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Dominique Pellico, the man accused of drugging his wife to sleep and recruiting dozens of men to abuse her for over 10 years, has admitted to all the charges against him. The 71-year-old admitted he was a rapist and said the 50 other co-defendants were aware of what they were doing. Supporters of Mrs. Pellico gave her a round of applause as she arrived in court in Avignon. Although no cameras are allowed in court, the trial is open to the public at the request of Giselle Pellico, who waived her right to anonymity. Since the trial began, Giselle has become a symbol of resilience and courage. Last weekend, thousands of people gathered in cities across France to show their support to her and other victims of rape. Donald Trump has recalled hearing shots fired by Secret Service agents as a would-be attacker hid in the bushes at his Florida golf course on Sunday. It was quite something, but it worked out well in Secret Service, did an excellent job. And uh, they have the man behind bars and hopefully he's going to be there for a long time. Dangerous person, very, very dangerous person. Speaking in a live stream on social media platform X, the Republican presidential candidate said he and a friend were grabbed by agents and bundled into golf carts as gunfire ran out. Two steps to your right! Meanwhile, police newly released body cam video shows law enforcement taking into custody the man suspected of firing the bullets. 58-year-old Ryan Routh is seen walking backwards with his shirt up before he is handcuffed and taken into custody. Secret Service agents spotted and fired on the alleged gunman in bushes a few hundred yards from where Mr. Trump was playing. Cellular data shows that the subject was in the vicinity of the golf course roughly 12 hours before the engagement with the United States Secret Service. Our investigative teams conducted a neighborhood canvas in an effort to collect and obtain relevant video footage. The subject had an active online presence and we are going through what he posted and any searches he conducted online. At least 19 people have now died in flooding in Poland, the Czech Republic, Romania and Austria. Italy is now also seeing heavy rain with frequent thunderstorms expected in the coming days. Experts say central regions could be badly affected. More than 5,000 troops have been deployed to support people in southern Poland. Meanwhile, Slovakia's capital Bratislava and the Hungarian capital Budapest have both been preparing for possible flooding as the river Danube rose. The flooding comes after storm Boris brought vast amounts of rain and snow at the weekend. Starvation in war-stricken Sudan is almost everywhere. That's according to the head of the World Health Organization after he visited the country. The situation of famine in Sudan is now the largest in the world, Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said. He said 12 million people were already displaced, adding that attention to the global community in Sudan was really low and race was a factor. Thousands of people have been killed since a civil war broke out in April 2023 between Sudan's army and the paramilitary rapid support forces. Firefighters have been battling a pipeline fire in La Porte near Houston in Texas. Aerial video shows the blaze shooting up a pillar of fire tens of feet into the sky, igniting a park and power poles nearby. Residents have been urged to evacuate, according to city spokesperson Lee Woodward. The cause of the fire remains unclear. Authorities have said no injuries have been reported as a result of the fire. And Stefan Ivanov and his son Maxim have celebrated their birthdays by rowing across the Arctic Ocean to appeal for protection of endangered ocean species. <laughs>
After 33 days, the boat crossed the Arctic Ocean, its crew hoping to claim the record for being the first to row across the Arctic from the southernmost point to the northernmost. Stefan and Maxim began building their own boat in 2019 to cross the ocean. In 2020, Maxim, at the age of 16, became the youngest rower to have crossed the Atlantic Ocean with his father. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel's studios in Lagos. Many thanks indeed, Simon, and welcome to Sports News. The president of the Confederation of African Football, Patrice Musepe, says the football body is concerned about situations where some member associations host their home games on neutral grounds owing to poor pitches in their countries. Mr. Musepe told newsmen at a media briefing in Nairobi, Kenya, that the football body is willing to work with these member associations so as not to deny football fans the opportunity to see home games. There's nothing that frustrates me more than a national team or a football team from a country to go and play outside. You can't build football in any country in Africa if the national team or the football clubs do not play in front of their nations. Because in every country, the emphasis is let's work together to make sure that we've got at least one stadium that's at the FIFA and CAF standards. And that's partly why this increase of money that we've been fighting for, you know, we've doubled what the member associations are getting now. And away from the continent, Manchester City midfielder Hernandez Rodri has sent a message of warning that players could be close to strike action over the amount of games they are required to play expanded Champions League football and FIFA Club World Cup formats alongside enlarged national team competitions has made for a greater number of games for top teams and players. And Rodri is the latest to say the workload is too great for the players. In the UEFA Champions League, Italian giants Juventus beat Dutch side PSV Eindhoven 3-1 at the Allianz uh, Stadium in Turin, while Aston Villa hammered Swiss side Young Boys 3-0. Six-time champions Liverpool beat AC Milan 3-1 in Italy, courtesy of goals from Ibrahima uh, Konate, Virgil van Dijk, Dominic Samoslai, of course, Bavarian giants Bayern Munich also hammering Dinamo Zagreb 9-2 with Hurricane scoring four goals of the game. Elsewhere, Kylian Mbappe and Tono Rudiger, Hendrik all got on the score sheet as defending champions Real Madrid beats German side Stuttgart 3-1. And Portuguese side Sporting Lisbon also got off to a winning start after beating Lille 2-0. In tennis, former champion Roger Federer says he hopes that Rafael Nadal would be able to play another season. The Spanish multiple French and US Open winner had announced his withdrawal from the 2024 Lava Cup where he was part of Team Europe last week. And Glasgow is set to host the 2026 Commonwealth Games after a deal was backed by the Scottish government. A scaled-down version of the events featuring fewer sports and athletes will return to the city 12 years after it last hosted the Games. The Australian state of Victoria was originally chosen to stage the multi-sport event but withdrew as host due to rising costs. And that's your sport tonight. I am Kelly Egiga. It's back to Anne. Thank you, Kelly. And the main news again. Former Chief of Army Staff Lieutenant General Theophilus Danjima has urged service chiefs to take immediate action to end the growing spate of bandit attacks across the country. As a Chief of Defense Staff, General Christopher Musa said the military is committed to safeguarding the nation. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Wawadu. Good night.